This is Mission Fest weekend, so we have a lot of things taking place here at Church of the Rock, and we're blessed to have one of the speakers from Mission Fest here in our midst. We have Dr. Yaw Purby. Dr. Yaw Purby is in charge of, of international, let me get this right, Students Ministry of Canada, International Students Ministry of Canada. And what they're, they're trying to do is they're realizing that God is bringing the nations here to Canada. And what's interesting, though, is that sometimes a, a foreigner will come, an international student will come, be here for four years. And at the end of four years, there's about 75 to 80 percent of those students who have never met a Christian or never been in a Christian home. And we have opportunities to minister. Uh, Dr. Purby is a medical doctor. Uh, and then God, in the midst of it, challenged his life to do more than medicine. And he ministered in Montreal in a church there. And he'll share a little bit about that. And now he's, he's ministering in a greater capacity, encouraging people to engage with international students. So, Dr. Purby, come on up. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. What's going on? You know the scripture that says many are called, few are chosen? Uh, here in Winnipeg, it reads, many are cold, few are frozen. <laughs> but you have an African preacher today, so let's do some thawing, okay? Now, back in Africa, when we preach, there's a response. And so, when we say praise the Lord, people shout back. <laughs> Somebody's taking the course. You shout back hallelujah. And you know, hallelujah means praise the Lord. You know, hallelujah is the same in every language. In Greek, it's hallelujah. In Spanish, in, in, in Korean, in every language, hallelujah is hallelujah. So when I say praise the Lord, you shout back hallelujah. Can we try that? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Yes. Now I feel at home. Thank you very much for inviting me to be part of your church. I've enjoyed being here at Mission Fest, but this morning's service, we had a great time. Oh, I met this, this, these two cute sisters who are from Korea, but did some of their education in Peru, and some of their education in Indonesia, and then they are now at the University of Manitoba. Isn't that cool? I've met fun, wonderful people here. Thank you for having me here. I bring you greetings from my family. That's my dear wife, Anjali. She's an economist and our five children so far. Um, <laughs> you see that one there? She's six months. She's our latest, not our last. <laughs> That's a difference. Uh, <laughs> we wanted to have seven, just seven. <laughs> Bring you greetings from our staff across the country, International Student Ministries. We have about 100 staff and about 500 volunteers across the country who minister to these international students that have come to our campuses. Uh, Twyla is at the back. You, you see that international student ministry stand near the central door. You can say hello to her at the end of the service and the other people among you as well. But it's a privilege to serve with these brothers and sisters from across Canada. And I bring you greetings from this church, a Chinese church that I used to pastor. Isn't that cool? You know, there's no time to talk about, I would have told you story after story about how missions has changed, how Brazilians are taking the gospel to Portugal and Nigerians are ministering in England and, 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 and Koreans are sending the gospel to First Nations in, in Canada. You know, missions is no longer from the West to the rest. It's God's people everywhere taking the gospel everywhere. And so only God can call an African to pastor an English-speaking Chinese church in a French city in North America. <laughs> I had the privilege of pastoring this church in Montreal for four years. I uh, gave it up a couple of years ago to focus on international students. And I'm excited to be preaching there next Sunday before I head back to Ghana for a bit. I want to, in all sobriety, give God glory for sparing my life exactly 10 years ago. This is an accident I was involved in while I was still a medical doctor. I was a captain in the army, serving with the United Nations in Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast. There were three of us traveling in the middle of the country, um, going down south, and uh, we got involved in this tragic accident. To cut a long story short, there were three of us in the car, the other two died. And uh, this was a turning point in my life. I knew God had spared me, not because I was a doctor, because the other doctor died. 
Not because I was a captain in the army, it didn't matter. I said, Lord, I want to spend the rest of my life preaching the gospel and raising younger leaders. Amen. And so that's what I've done since 2009. That's how come I'm here today, not to prescribe medicine, but to preach the gospel. Yeah. But once a doctor, always a doctor. I just work on the software now, not the hardware. <laughs> Good. This morning, we want to look at something uh, themed, reaching the unreached within our reach. Because Mission Fest this year has focused on reaching all people by all possible means. And I'm making the argument this morning that the people we are trying to reach are actually within our reach. And I'm going to show you stories, I'm going to give you examples, I'm going to show us through scripture as well. In fact, these are students at the University of Sherbrooke, University of uh, um, Bishop's University in Sherbrooke. She's from Iran, comes for Bible studies. She's from Algeria, she's the president of the Iranian Students Association at the University of Sherbrooke. I am telling you, the people we are trying to reach are within our reach. You know, this is not my style. I like to jump in the crowd, and, but Pastor Keith says I can't go past this second stage. <laughs> so, I'm sorry, guys. You know, I, it's his fault. All because of the cameras. I, I, I'm always a nightmare for, for cameramen. He, we must clap for this guy. He's done a great job. <laughs> so, reaching the unreached within our reach, right within our reach. And when I think about this, reaching the unreached within our reach, there are two themes, two opposing themes that come to mind. I think about our sentness as Christians, the fact that God has called us and sent us into the world with this glorious message of the gospel, but at the same time, sometimes our blindness to that calling or to the people that God is asking us to reach. And I'm going to prove that to you from the book of John. You see, it, you see very clearly from the book of John, but I'm also going to show us how the church in Winnipeg, how the church in Manitoba, how the church in Canada may be grappling with this idea that, yes, we've been sent, but in a lot of ways, we kind of are blinded to who we've been sent to. Let me demonstrate with this picture. What's wrong with this picture? <laughs> Some of you, it's taking you a while to see it. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about now. <laughs> So these guys on safari, obviously looking for lions and stuff like that. Look at the lion right there looking at them. <laughs> All right? you know? And, and, and this, this looks like a very funny picture, but maybe spiritually that is how funny we look. Because here we are at Mission Fest, here we are at Church of the Rock and say, let's go to China, let's go to Nepal, let's reach Indonesia, the most populous Muslim country on the earth, and all etc., etc., etc. But the people from those places may be right in our backyards. And yet we don't see. One of the contemporary songs I love is, Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eye. You know, it's amazing how many times Paul writes in the scriptures and says, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ will open your eyes. Because sometimes the obvious is, is, is hidden in plain sight. I mean, think about it. You remember there's a prophet in the book of Numbers called Balaam. He was going to curse the people of Israel. Do you remember Numbers chapter 23? He was riding his donkey and God sent an angel to strike him dead because God was not happy with him. The prophet did not see. Who saw? The donkey. He did not, he beat the donkey. He beat the donkey. Why are you deviating from the road? He, and the donkey was like, <laughs> and you call me an ass? <laughs> <laughs> Guys, unless the Lord opens our eyes, we may not see. I mean, think about it. The greatest event ever since the creation of the world in history was about to happen. God had come in the flesh. Jesus born in Bethlehem in Judea. And wise men saw. We just celebrated Christians, Christmas. You know, they came all the way from the east. They traveled two years. Two years to get to Jerusalem because they had seen a star. And they had come to worship. And guess what? The people in Jerusalem had no clue. In fact, they went to Herod's palace, they took the books, the professors and the theologians, they picked the scrolls, they said, Bethlehem, Ephrata, you are no least among the nations, out of you will come a savior, blah, blah, blah. It didn't even occur to them, why don't you go to Bethlehem? Think about the two disciples on the road to Emmaus after Jesus had resurrected. They had no idea. 
that they were walking with Jesus. Do you remember that story? They were walking with Jesus, and Jesus was like, what's up? And they're like, man, are you the only stranger in town? Don't you watch CNN? You don't have CBC? You know what was going on? This Jesus guy, we thought he was going to be a savior. Da, 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 da. They went on and on and on and on. They, uh, they started talking to Jesus about Jesus. <laughs> I'm just making the point that if God does not open our eyes, we may miss the obvious. Right in front of our eyes, and that is the argument this morning. If you look at the book of John, I talk about that, that, that irony, the paradox between sentness and blindness. Because the book of John is a summary. If you look at the book of John, it's all about sentness. Right from John 1.1, any Jewish boy, any Jewish person who picks John 1.1 will immediately realize what John was trying to do. John picked John 1.1 and he wrote, anybody would remember Genesis 1.1, in the beginning. That's how John starts. Anybody who reads that will go immediately to Genesis, to the Torah. Said, ha, ah, this sounds familiar. And John says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was already there in the beginning. He was with God. He was with God. Oh, time will not allow me. I could, I could preach an, just an hour just on the Trinity and it will not be enough. How? We call it the imminent Trinity. How God has already, always existed as Father, Son, and Spirit. You see, God is one, but He's not alone. Mm, you didn't get that. Mm, God, God exists, Father, Son, and Spirit in what theologians call perichoresis, a perfect dance with Himself. Father and Son worshiping the Spirit, the sins, the Spirit worshiping the Son. Father, like this beautiful dance throughout eternity. God Himself is the missionary God. We got to get that clear. As people who have been sent on missions, it's not our mission, it's Missio Day. The mission of God. It's his mission. In fact, the great commission, we've got to change it. We've got to call it the great co-mission. Because sometimes we think it's our mandate. It is a joining with God on a mission he's always, always been on. In fact, creation itself is the mission of God explored. Wow. So John begins with that sentence. Because John 1, 6, the Bible says, God sent a man. His name was John. Don't forget that he is the sending God. He is the missionary God. Not just that. You come down to verse 10 and, the, and, and verse 14 and the Bible says God himself decided to come. He is the missionary God. He came. He wrapped himself in human flesh and the word became flesh. And I love the way Eugene Peterson puts it. And he moved into our neighborhood. God. Becoming a man. God is the sender. God is the sent. Make no mistake. It is not our job. We are joining him on his mission. So John begins very clearly about this sentness. And in fact, throughout the book of John, the word sent is used about 50 times. Jesus often usually will say, I was sent, just as I was sent. The Father sent, etc. All the way to the end of John, John chapter 20, where Jesus said, As the Father sent me, so send I you. John 20, 21. So that, that theme of sentness is throughout the book of John. But the theme of blindness is also found throughout the book of John. We'll be dwelling on a bit of it in John chapter 4 in particular. But not just John chapter 4. John chapter 1. This God who made the whole earth comes in the person of Jesus in the flesh. And the Bible says he came to his own. They did not recognize him. Blindness. John chapter 2. Jesus says, you know what? I'm going to destroy this temple. I'm going to build it again in three days. They're like, huh? What? Are you crazy? Poco loco. I have some Latino friends here. It means you are crazy. What are you talking about? It took us years to build this temple. You're going to do it in three days. They did not realize. They were blind to what he was talking about. He was talking about his body. Blindness in John chapter 2. John chapter 3. He's talking to somebody who should know better. A teacher of the law. A Pharisee. Nicodemus. He says, Nicodemus, you must be born again. And the guy starts thinking about obstetrics and gynecology. Thank you, you got it wrong. I'm not talking about being born in my mother's womb. In fact, he asked that question. I was like, do I need to go back into my mother's womb? Like, he was like, duh. <laughs> he does not see it. 
He's talking about spiritual rebirth. John chapter 4, which we'll be looking at, hey, he meets this woman at the well. They start talking about water. The woman thinks that he's talking about physical water, H2O, which he's going to give her, not realizing he's talking about eternal life. Then he talks about food to the disciples. They come with food. They come with fast food. I'll talk about that later. I know it was fast food. They brought the food, and Jesus is like, forget about the food. I have food to eat that you have no clue about. They're like, huh? They did not realize he was talking about the work of God as his food. Then they talk about the harvest. Jesus said, there's a harvest. There's a harvest coming. And they're like, oh, yeah, in four months' time, you know, the barley will be ready. He's like, no, the harvest is now. They're like, huh? He's like, don't you see? The Samaritans, they are coming. The Samaritans are coming. There's a harvest about it. They did not see. I could go on and on. John chapter 6, he talked about his body and his blood. And they were like, has this guy a cannibal? How can he give us his body and blood to eat? I could go on and on and on. But the theme... In fact, by John chapter 12, John is quoting Isaiah when God said through Isaiah that these people's eyes will be blinded. Their hearts will be hardened. They will not get it. By John chapter 20, God is speaking to Thomas. He says, Thomas, blessed are those who have not yet seen, but believe. So we see this contrasting theme throughout the book of John. And I just want us to read a bit of John, John chapter 4, verse 30. Let's read it together from 34 to 38. Are you ready? Good. Let's go. My food... Oh, I can't hear you. Let's go. My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying, it's still four months into harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage. Yes, go on. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. We're going to, we're going to pull this scripture apart very soon. But let me give you an idea of the state of unreachedness in our world. Because we're talking about reaching the unreached by all possible means. When we say the unreached, it's a technical term, because it does not mean that these people have never heard the gospel. Now, when we say a group of people are unreached, an ethnic group, a people group are unreached, it means 2%, less than 2% of them have come to know Jesus. Because 2% is what you know, sociologists say, it takes 2% of any population to change the population. I, I, time will not allow me to go into some modern examples, but 2%. In fact, Robert Bella said in the 70s that if 2% of the population can have a new vision for their society, they can change it. 2%. And so we classify an, a people as unreached if two, less than 2% of them are evangelical Christian because once they reach 2%, we believe they can be a self-propagating national church or people church among their own and, and reach the whole of the population. Guess what? As we speak today, there are still about 6,000 people groups in the world that are unreached. 2,000 years after we were given the homework, and you think your children are slow. <laughs> Let's look at the situation in the world today. 2.3 billion Christians. That's wonderful. Think about it. There used to be just Jesus and the 12. So this is awesome. All right? We didn't celebrate that. 5 billion churches, like Church of the Rock. Awesome. Did you know there are 43,000 denominations? Whoa. 12 million Christian workers. The command is clear. Go and make disciples of all nations. Guess what? Yet the work is not being done as much as we thought. Because we are still about 3,000 languages without a Bible. 3,000 people groups with no missionary. A million villages without a church. 3.5 billion Hindus, Muslims, Buddhists without God and salvation in the world. Actually, it just came from a meeting last year in Germany where it was revealed that 87% of the world's Buddhist, Hindus, Muslims do not personally know a Christian. They haven't met anybody who says, I follow Jesus. And that is what we're talking about, like Pastor Keith mentioned. That is the tragedy because these people move into your neighborhood in Winnipeg and for four years, they don't encounter you. And they go back. That is not right. The point I'm making is this, 
The people we are trying to reach are here. And like that lion crouching behind the guys on safari, the people we are trying to reach, we are trying to look for, they are here and actually looking for us. Both the harvest and the harvesters, those who reach their own people are here. And just an example, not counting the temporary foreign workers and immigrants and all of that, just as an example, international students alone, we have between 400,000 and half a million international students in Canada from about 190 nations of the earth. Wow. Reaching the unreached right within our reach. Let me give you an example. These 10 countries have the most least reached people. Japan. Japan is less than 1% Christian. Japan, China, Thailand, India, Iran, Nigeria has a lot of unreached people, about 98, not too much. India and China have the most unreached ethnic groups. You can see that. You know why I'm showing you this map? Compared to this one. Where are most of our international students coming from in Canada? Japan, Korea, China. Do you see India? Between China and India, the two groups with the most unreached people groups are the highest we have in Canada of international students. Pakistan, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Nigeria. Is this an accident? Could the God of the universe be orchestrating this for a purpose? Ladies and gentlemen, every generation has a unique opportunity. This is ours. This is ours. You know, it's time for what I call smart missions. Do you remember those, these kind of phones? They, they were like weapons, eh? I mean, like, you didn't need dumbbells. You just needed those phones and you were good. <laughs> You know, but everything has gone high-tech, reduced to nano, whatever. I mean, everything's gone smart. We have smartphones, smart TVs. What else is smart? Smart cars. I recently heard of smart concrete. Everything is getting smart, except the people. But I say it's time for smart missions. What do I mean by smart missions? This is, this is what I'm talking about. That, you know, smart missions is, why don't we empower these international students, okay? Or internationals among us. Help them. Help meaning provide hospitality and friendship, evangelism and discipleship, leadership training, prepare them, partner, and send them. Send help these international students to go and heal the world, bring hope to the world, bring evangelism and discipleship to the world, attitudinal change, leadership to the world in every sphere, all the seven mountains of society. This is what I think is a smart thing to do. And it seems I'm hitting on something God is doing, and I'll come to that. Dallas Willard passed away a couple of years ago, a great philosopher, University of Southern California. He said, God periodically moves upon his people and in their surrounding culture to achieve his everlasting purposes for that tiny stretch of cosmic time we call human history. Let me skip because of time. But this is the point he's making, that often we miss the opportunity to act with God in the now. We fail to find quickly enough the new wine skins for the new wine. Oh, God, help us. Oh, God, help us to catch it. Because throughout the history of the world and throughout the Bible, you can check from Genesis to Revelation, people movements are God movements. You know, people think they are moving, I want a better education in Canada, or I'm fleeing war in my country, or I want a better life, or whatever. They think they are moving. They do not realize it's God who moves people. Acts chapter 17, the Bible says that it's God who determines our times and the exact places where people should be. Why does he do it? Paul tells them in the Areopagus on Acts 17, 26 and 27, he says God does this so that people will seek him and perhaps reach out to him and find him. God moves people. Acts 8 4. You see that, especially in the book of Acts, that after Paul's, uh, Peter's, uh, what is it, Stephen's persecution, they started scattering. And Acts 8 4 says, Those who have been scattered preach the gospel wherever they went. When people move, the gospel moves. People, God moves people either to spread his fame or to get to know his name. And so what you read in the news and CNN calls global disruption, you know, immigration, refugees, oh my word, all these people moving, and the people think the world is in confusion. God is actually on the move. God is on the move. You need to be careful not to think like a Republican or a Democrat. 
or a liberal or whatever else you call yourself. Think biblical. Think missiological. Because you may be fighting the very thing that God is doing. Look, Andrew Walls, a missiologist and historian, says, when we look at church history, migration was an even more significant event in history than even the Reformation itself. That's an audacious statement. I believe we are living in the days that Daniel prophesied about. That many will go back and forth and knowledge will increase. Think about the internet. The wealth of information. Look at wealth travel. How some of your teams are going to Dominican Republic. You just get up one day, you know, five hours, you are wherever you want to get to. Like, when my grandfather was an international student in the 1940s, it took him two weeks to get from Ghana to England to go to school on a boat. Globalization, information technology, migration. This is the world we are living in. Look at the trend, and it's going to keep going higher and higher. Actually, as of now, 2018, there are about 250 million people on the move. Never in the history of the world have there been more people on the move, whether it's for education, whether it's because of war, whether it's because of economic reasons. Never in the history of the world have there been more people on the move. For me, it tells me that God is on the move than ever before in the history of the world to close this thing called history, this thing called time. Will the church arise? Smart missions for me is this. You can't create waves. Why don't you find the waves God has already built and learn to surf his waves? I think it's smarter than trying to whip up a wave, which many of us are trying to do. And that's the way Jesus did it in John 5. Jesus said, truly I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, that the son does as well. Let's look at what God is doing. Where is God moving? What is he doing in our days? And he's stepping it. And step in it, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. As the Father has sent me, so send I you. That's my missions. In fact, for those of us who work with international students, the NIV version really excites us because the scripture actually says many will go here and there because they want to get a degree. <laughs> because they want to learn. To increase knowledge. And that's why we see five million people in the world traveling around to get an education. There are some in this place right now. I just met Carol from Colombia. I told you about the Koreans I met this morning. I met Chinese. I met Ghanaians. I met, and they are here. Let me give you four reasons as we close. Four reasons why this is smart. Number one, it's a statistically sensible thing to reach out to the students. The numbers just make sense. Just in 1975, there were about 800,000 international students in the world. As we speak now, there are about 5 million. It's projected that by 2025, there will be 8 million. Canada alone has, what, half a million of them. You know, God is doing something in Canada. Let's wake up. Because, you know, the United States has 1.2 million, 1.3 million international students. That's a lot. But there are 350 million people. We are barely 35 million in Canada, and yet we have half a million. Look at it per capita. It's phenomenal what God wants to do with our country. Let the church arise let the church arise and see what God is doing in our midst. It's statistically sensible, but guess what? It's scripturally sound. You know, Leviticus 19, God says, love the stranger as yourself. A lot of times we just read the part that says, love your neighbor as yourself. That same chapter of Leviticus, you go a few verses down, it says, love the stranger, love the foreigner as yourself. It is a scripturally sound thing to do, ladies and gentlemen. God tells us that. In fact, hospitality is so important to God. In the New Testament, if you are not a hospitable person, you are disqualified from being an elder or a pastor. It's one of the criteria. He or she must be hospitable. It is stunningly simple. I mean, how hard is it to cook a meal and get someone to eat it? You know, you know, God, is, God is literally teasing us. You know, it's like, I asked you to go to the nations. You didn't go enough, so I brought them. Right? Yeah, literally. I'm telling you, you choose which, na which nation you want to go to as a missionary. I'll walk you to the University of Manitoba and put you in that nation. <laughs> Stunningly simple. This girl, Sanjita, she came to know the Lord because she landed in the Calgary airport. She had not booked a, 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 a transport. She had not booked a place to stay. One of our staff picked her up. He didn't know her from Adam. Took her home. She got a ride. She got a place to stay for three years. You know what that did to this girl from India who did not know these people, they did not know her? She said, wow. She was so touched by the love and the care and concern. She said, these are her own words she told me. 
She said, after a while, I began to search for the God of the Canadians. Is someone searching for the God of the Canadians? The God of the Church of the Rock guys. It's so simple. All of a sudden, we are missionaries who don't go anywhere. Like you don't need a short, you don't need a passport, you don't need a visa. You don't even need to learn Chinese. In fact, they come to you and say, can you teach us English? Yeah. I mean, I don't know whether I should call it smart missions. Maybe I should call it dumb missions. No, serious. It's like, hello. <laughs> Finally, of course, I've already told you it's a strategically smart thing. Actually, the reason why my book is called Thinking Outside the Window is that when I became president of ISMC, I was praying about the 1040 window, this place we've prayed for since 1989. And God said to me, yeah, I'm thinking outside the window. I pulled people out of the window and put them right here in Canada. And so I looked at the numbers in Canada at that time. This was about four or five years ago. And the number one sending country of students was China, the stronghold of Buddhism. Number two was India, the stronghold of Hinduism. Number three is Korea, also in the window. Number four was Saudi Arabia, the stronghold of Islam. Is that an accident? Let me talk about three things that may be blinding us and then we pray that God will open our eyes. From the scripture we read, I think there are three C's. There are more, but I think I'll pick three C's. Consumerism, our own culture. It may even be our church culture, not just our ethnic culture. And our own ideas. Consumerism. I love this. Work, work, work. Buy, buy, buy. Consume, consume, consume. And then die. (laughs) Isn't that the life we live? I'm telling you, it's buy, 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 bills, bills, bills. Jesus, you know, the disciples brought the food to Jesus. I'm so tempted, I'm so tempted to go across. <laughs> oh, this is so hard. They, take me back to Africa. Oh. <laughs> the, the, the disciples brought food because Jesus had asked them to go and get the food. They come back with the food. That's why I told you it was fast food because they brought it fast, right? They brought the food and Jesus is like, oh, I have food to eat that you don't know anything about. They're like, huh? Somebody brought him food and Jesus is like, this is my food. To do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Let me ask you, what is your food? What's your diet? What nourishes you? What satisfies you? What is your food? What do you eat? Mission Fest once a year. You cannot eat once a year. What is your food? Oh, what do you eat? Let me put it another way. What eats you? Because that thing that eats you is really what your heart is on and you're dwelling on. That thing that wakes you up in the middle of the night. Consumerism. And I'm talking about culture. These are are Muslim girls that they open the Bible and study with us. They want to know Jesus. How can you do this in Iran? You'll be dead. And yet they can do it in Canada. I know them by name. They do Bible study with us. Jesus said, what is it about your culture that is not making you see? For the disciples, they were Jews. This was Samaria. They did not deal with women. In fact, it was a double trouble because it was a Samaritan woman. That's what a triple trouble, that kind of woman. (laughs) Man, what is it about your culture, your ethnic culture, your church culture? You know, we Mennonites, we don't or whatever. Come on. Or your own, con- your own conceptions, you know, your own mindsets. Maybe you need a paradigm shift this morning. The disciples were thinking four months to the harvest. You know, they did not realize the harvest was right there. They just saw one woman, Jesus was seeing a harvest. They were thinking four months, Jesus was thinking now. What mindsets may you have that may be preventing you from seeing the harvest that is right here? Reaching the unreached within our reach. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, This is smart. This is smart. Jesus said, even now the one who draws a wage, verse 38, and harvests a crop for eternal life, so that the sower and reaper may be glad together. That's the same. One sows and another reaps is true. Look at what Jesus said. He said, guys, this is smart. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Isn't that smart? You know why he's saying that? He's moved the nations into your neighborhood. You didn't do anything about it. In fact, parents are paying fees for children to come. Guess what? The government of Canada is doing the work for us. The government of Canada wants to double the number of international students in the country. The government of Saudi Arabia is working for missions. They say, go, go, go to Canada. Go and learn English. And we're like, yo. Guys, I mean, Saudi Arabia is able to send 400 students to one campus just to learn English. Jesus said, I've done the work for you. 
Scholarship secretaries are doing the work for you. The governments are doing the work for you. Will you just reap the harvest? Will you get off your blessed assurance and do something? <laughs> Let me end with this story. I have a minute to go. Pastor, Pastor Keith said, oh, you know, the second service, you can go just a bit more. And like, you know, in Africa, a bit more is like three, four hours, you know. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it, it amazes me. You know, back in Africa, not everybody has a watch. But everybody has time. And then I move here and everybody has a watch, but nobody has time. So I don't know. But don't worry, I'm within time. Let me end with this story because Winnipeg, you guys have done it before. Do it again. And do it again and again and again. I met this lady in Seattle Missions Fest. I was speaking at Seattle Missions Fest, October 2016. And I was sharing the story of a young man who was a Sikh. You know the Sikhs? The ones with the turban and with the dagger. Who came from India to Winnipeg, University of Manitoba to study. And became a Christian through a couple that just invited him home to have a meal, read the Bible together and stuff like that. I shared that screen and this young lady runs to me at the end of Mission Fest and said, Uncle Baxing, Uncle Baxing. She knew the guy. That's the guy that dedicated her as a baby. And so she sent me some slides. By the way, this is Bak Singh. Guess what? Bak Singh becomes a Christian in Winnipeg, goes back to India, starts an indigenous church planting movement, and they plant 10,000 churches. That's just one couple. I tell you, this couple, John and Edith Hayward in Winnipeg, but I, by the way, I heard a story that Edith had always wanted to go to India as a missionary, but she never got to go. I don't know why, whether it was health or whatever, but she never got to go. Now ask, tell me, did she really need to go? I, I wonder whether she would have planted 10,000 churches. Ladies and gentlemen, right from Winnipeg. And so Lima sends me these pictures. So Baksin goes back to India, and this is Lima's parents. He disciples them, he counsels them, he marries them. That's them. There. I have no clue why he's sitting in the middle of the couple. I don't understand. <laughs> But that's Bak Singh there. And so he commissions them in ministry together. Their ministry in India, so he moves from Winnipeg back to India, right? Their ministry in India, Lima's parents, was working with the university students. That's Lima's dad right there, discipling university students in India. And then he himself moves to the U.S. as an international student. Lima's dad, that is. That's the family. As they grew up, they incorporated the children in the ministry. Guess what? Ten years later, Lima herself is a missionary in China. I, do you see how the ripples go? It's a God thing. It's an absolute, you know, so guess what? She gets married to a Chinese. Wow, it's getting very complicated. They get commissioned into ministry together and they work, they actually live in Seattle now. That's how I met them there, working among low income and immigrant populations. That's the family. Children are part of the ministry. They work with refugees and all of that. And that's my wife and I when we met them in Mission Fest. Ladies and gentlemen, who knows where the wave will go next? Just drop that pebble in your backyard. Think about it. Your backyard, your barbecue could be affecting eternity. What are we going to do about this? Two things. I'm praying that sadness and blindness will no longer characterize reaching the unreached right within our reach. Learn more and pray. That's the first thing. You know, the better informed you are, the better you can pray. There are many books around. I'm not just talking about my books. Ravi Zacharias has some great books. There are books all over the place. Listen, learn more so you can pray strategically. In fact, I ask you to download the operation. Well, go to Google Play or, or Apple Store. Buy, do not buy, it's free. Download Operation World so that you can pray. You can actually, if you start next week, you can pray for every country in the world by the end of the year. How hard is that? By the way, Jason Mandrick, who edits this, is, is, is from Winnipeg. So he's like, tell my folks to download it. So we'll be checking how many downloads are coming from Winnipeg. No. But learn and pray. And the last thing I want to say is this. Welcome and host somebody. Uh, we're going to add Winnipeg to this, to this website. Um, there are a number of cities in Canada on it. We're going to add Winnipeg. It's called friendsfordinner.ca. But today, what you can do is just go to our desk there and write your name, email, telephone, and say, I want to host somebody. How hard is it? We do this just Christmas Thanksgiving, Easter, just host somebody, just a meal, and you'll be amazed what God will do. You'll be amazed how God will pick a conversation. You'll be amazed a scripture verse that is read. You'll be amazed what God will do to the ends of the earth because of your little obedience in the city of Winnipeg. 
You know, J.D. Payne, a friend of mine, says, something is misiologically malignant. When we are willing to send people across the oceans, risking life and limb and spending enormous amounts of money, but we are not willing to walk next door and minister to the strangers living there. That's absurd. <laughs> but it's all going to be cured from this weekend. I pray so. This is our prayer, and I want us to bow our heads and pray that every international student in Canada, and you could say in your neighborhood, will have the opportunity to encounter the gospel, and then they become a catalyst for an evangelical church for every people. The 6,000 unreached people groups, that through them, who you reach here, they will reach their people. Christ-like leaders for every church, and kingdom impact in every sphere of society. Lord, this is our prayer. We know this is your heart because we look at the book of Revelation chapter 7 and we see that the nations, every people, every tribe, every tongue is gathered around the throne worshiping the Lord and the Lamb. May the little we do in this place, may the meal we serve, the English we teach, the home we provide, may all these count, O oh God, in that great picture in the book of Revelation. And that from Winnipeg, Reaching the unreached within our reach. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to the ends of the earth. And then the end will come. Oh Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. It's a great message, wasn't it? Several things I want to do just in closing here. Don't leave. But did you sense his enthusiasm? <laughs> a little bit of passion, a little bit of excitement. You know, because he has met with God, God stirred a desire that others would meet with God too. And maybe some here you say, well, you know, I actually haven't met with God. I don't know if I were to die tonight that I would go to heaven. Well, God would want to touch you first in a real way so that you can come into a personal walk with Jesus Christ. So then you have something to share with those around you. And I'm not going to embarrass any of you. I'm not going to single you out or call you forward. Actually, I'd ask you all just to bow your heads and close your eyes. And if perhaps you don't know for certain if you die tonight, then God's tugging at your heart. Maybe, you're, obviously, you're in a church service, or maybe you're serving in some capacity in some way, but you don't have a real walk with God, and God wants to bring you into that. And all I'd like you to do is you say, yeah, that's me, and I need a personal walk with Jesus Christ, with God. Then would you signal to God and myself by just raising your hand? Anybody here say, yeah, that's what I need. I need that. It's essential for me. Is anybody here? Say, that's what I want. Just raise your hand. Thank you in the middle section, the blue. Anybody else? Thank you, sir, in the middle as well. Okay, there's probably others. I haven't seen your hands. Some of you should have put up your hands and you didn't, but I'd like you to lead you in prayer. And I said I wouldn't single you out, so I'd like the whole congregation, please join in together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I come before you, and I need your help. I need your strength. But my sins separate me from you. Jesus, I invite you to come into my life. I ask that you would take away my sins. And I thank you that you're doing that now. Bring me into a walk with you. Bring your hope and joy to me. And Holy Spirit, bring your life to me. Help me to share the goodness of you with others now. I pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's give our Lord a hand. Yes, God.